What about this internet thing? Do you, do you know anything about that? Sure. <laughs> what, what the hell is that exactly? Well, it's, it's become a place where people are publishing information. Right. So you, everybody can have their own homepage. Companies are there, the latest information. It's wild what's going on. You can send electronic mail to people. Uh, it is the big new thing. Yeah, but you know, uh, it's easy to criticize something you don't fully understand, which is my position here. Let's make that safe, guys. Picture's up. We like that position. Hey guys, check your cell phone. Make sure everybody's set on vibrate, please. No open walkies on set. Okay, let's do last looks, please. Thank you. Okay, let's get everybody in the place. Let's get ready to lock up the doors. Thank you. Lock it up, gang. Okay? Here we go. From the top, reading from the dolly prompter. <clears throat> Settle in, please. Let's roll sound and roll cameras. Roll it. All right, here you go, guys. There's four cameras. Common mark. And I'm Brian Armstrong, co-founder and CEO of Coinbase. When Coinbase first got started, we were a simple place for people to buy and sell Bitcoin. The largest U.S. cryptocurrency exchange is about to be a publicly traded company after years of skepticism from Wall Street about Bitcoin. Coinbase is a company with an ambitious vision to create more economic freedom for every... <laughs> Let's try that one again. Coinbase really helped take cryptocurrency from an internet hobby for coders to a mainstream investment today. I imagined a world where anybody with a smartphone could have access to sound money and financial services, where every payment could be as fast, cheap, and global as sending an email. We're helping make this happen by building the open financial system for the world. That sounded like a question. <laughs> for the world? For the world! <laughs> by building the open financial system for the world. We're <laughs> I grew up in San Jose, California. The early days of the dot-com boom was happening in Silicon Valley. Pretty cool guy, bro. The spacecraft has landed. It was kind of a nerdy household. <laughs> right there with the camera. Mm -hmm. What is your name and how are you related to me? I'm Dave Armstrong and I'm your dad. My dad was an environmental engineer. Okay, right here. If you don't know now, it's too late. My mom worked at IBM. She was one of the early women computer programmers. I was really shy as a kid and I felt like I have these good ideas, but people don't listen to me. Hello, everyone. This is Brian's room. My molecule poster. And my e he was very interested in computers, so we shopped around and tried to find a deal on a used one, and we finally got him one that was a pretty good working computer, but it had a German keyboard, and so we said, uh, <laughs> here's your computer, Brian. Uh, it's up to you to figure out how to use it. In high school, I built this website, and I remember I went to sleep, and I woke up in the morning, and I checked the stats, and like a 1,000 people looked at it while I was sleeping. It's like making a copy of myself, talking to these 1,000 people all over the world, that was like the coolest feeling ever. When I went to college, my roommate and I were trying to think about how to make some extra cash. And I realized if we were to tutor high school students, man, we could make great money. We decided, let's make a web app. It was called University Tutor. And I thought getting customers would be the hard part. But the movement of the money was actually the hardest part. Somebody from our bank called us one day. And they're like, what are you guys doing? Why is this money moving in these certain patterns? And you know, um, are you aggregating customer funds? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And it felt like I was actually being treated like a criminal. I was disappointed. I couldn't ever get it to break out and be a real success. So after I graduated college, I ended up selling it. I felt like, what do I want to do with my life? I wanted to put myself out of my comfort zone. So I decided to move to Buenos Aires for a year. Where are you gonna live? Well, I don't know. There's this pension or something. <laughs> I'll go see if they have a room there. And, I mean, it's just sort of really loose, freer than I would have been. One of the things I did notice living in Argentina is that they have this really amazing culture and people there are really proud, but they also have this history of really deep distrust of the government. I got to see what a economy and a culture looked like that had gone through um, hyperinflation and didn't have a well-run monetary system. I remember these menus I saw at a restaurant, prices would update due to inflation frequently enough that they had to put new stickers on top instead of printing new menus. One of the things that stuck with me was that they didn't believe that the future could be better. 
I remember feeling kind of frustrated about that. It felt like, yeah, this is just kind of wrong. Around Christmas time, 2010, I came back to California, and I was just home with my family. And I happened to come across the Bitcoin white paper. I think it was Christmas dinner, and we were saying, come on down, we got dinner hot on the table. And he was saying, just wait, just wait. It was describing something kind of like the internet that was global and decentralized that no company or country owned. But instead of for moving information around like the internet, it was for moving value around. I thought, oh my gosh, this could have an enormous impact on the world. I remember my mother at some point was like, you know, come down and spend time with the family. And I was like, I'm reading this really important thing. <laughs> I don't know. He didn't come down and talk about it, though, dear. No, no, not because we wouldn't have understood it if he did. <laughs> <laughs> After Christmas, I got back on the plane. I started flying back to Buenos Aires. I remember having this sinking feeling in my stomach. Oh my gosh, why am I leaving? I'm going the wrong direction. The Bitcoin white paper was a major technological breakthrough. It actually solved a number of major computer science challenges, and it allowed a new thing to exist in the world that people found valuable. Each time we figured out how to do a new thing on the internet, we fundamentally disrupted a major industry. Email disrupted the postal office. The World Wide Web disrupted all of media and advertising. SSL allowed us to do commerce over the internet. One way to conceive of Bitcoin is it's the technology that allows us to move money over the internet. We've had lots of digital monies for a long time but they were regulated by banks and other big large institutions like a national government. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that takes a very different view where it's decentralized and not in the control of a central state. Anyone can access and earn and receive, store and send Bitcoin without asking anyone for permission. No matter where they are in the world, all they need is internet access. Bitcoin is providing a form of economic freedom to everybody on Earth that we never had before. Bitcoin is giving the power to the people and making it more of an even playing field. Doesn't matter their background, their race, ethnicity, poor kids, black kids, Spanish kids, whoever, you can participate and not have to be from Wall Street. Modern money as we know it more or less started in the Depression in the 1930s. And yet it feels to us that the way money is now is the way money has always been, and that any other way to do money is ridiculous. Money becomes money when a lot of people believe that it is money, right? Like, if I make up Goldstein bucks and only I think it's money, it's not money. But if 100 people think it's money, then it's like kind of money for those 100 people. If we all buy and sell stuff with it, it's like money a little bit for us. If a million people think it's money, like it's pretty money-ish now. If 100 million people think it's money, it is definitely money. Bitcoin today still feels to many people like an uncertain, slightly crazy, outside of the mainstream idea. Back up 10 years ago, people would have thought you absolutely insane. I came back from Argentina and eventually took a job at Airbnb but I kind of just couldn't stop thinking about Bitcoin. I just had this very visceral sense that the economy is becoming more global, but many of countries around the world don't have stable financial systems, and it's deeply unfair. I really believed in the potential of Bitcoin to create empowerment for people, but it needs to be dramatically easier to use and trusted and safe. Using Bitcoin at that time was pretty difficult. If you wanted to buy some, you had to send a wire to one of the only Bitcoin exchanges at that time called Mt. Gox, which was in Japan. Frankly, it was not the most trustworthy place. Authorities in Tokyo arrested the former head of the Japan-based Mt. Gox for allegedly falsifying financial records. Several hundred million dollars were unaccounted for. Also, by the way, if you actually acquire any Bitcoin and your hard drive crashed, your Bitcoin would be gone. So I felt like the solution is a hosted Bitcoin wallet. In the evenings and weekends, I started tinkering with this prototype. The big idea was make Bitcoin easier to use. Just the concept of cryptocurrency, what's that? You know, and how are you gonna make a living off of it? I'm yeah. not sure we still understand that. Yeah. 
the analogies that I had in my mind were services like Gmail. If you lost your phone or your computer, your email wasn't all gone. It was in the cloud and people were doing security and backups for you. Remember I was talking to somebody, yeah, I'm thinking about launching a hosted Bitcoin wallet. And this guy was like, oh my gosh, that's a terrible idea. I thought maybe I'm crazy. You know, I was like, I think this is kind of cool and interesting, but like nobody else seems to think so. Let me apply to Y Combinator and see what they say. Y Combinator is a startup incubator, meaning it funds a whole bunch of startups at once and then tries to help them get rolling. The minute I got accepted into Y Combinator, I decided I was quitting my job at Airbnb and starting this new company. How is he going to survive? Does he have health care? What's going to happen here? Does he have enough to eat? So unfortunately, very few startups succeed. We tend to think of the ones that do, Google or PayPal, these kind of iconic public companies. This is why we created Huddle. Statistically, the chance of a startup going public is less than a percent for sure. I can't wait to tell you more. Going public is for founders what winning an Academy Award is for an actor. All right, I need to pick some name for this thing. I happened to be reading the Wikipedia entry for the Bitcoin protocol, and I saw the word Coinbase in there. Coinbase is OK. I didn't love the name, but I'll change it later. Coinbase is a hosted Bitcoin platform. You can access your money from any device. You don't have to worry about security and backups. We'd love to have you bring it. We'd love to have you help us bring it to the rest of them. I need a... <laughs> For three months, you go through this Y Combinator boot camp, and then you go pitch at Demo Day in front of all these investors. Coinbase is doing for Bitcoin what iTunes did to the MP3. Brian's idea was not a hot deal with investors after Demo Day. This was not the one that every investor in the Valley was talking about and felt like they had to have a piece of. It was really depressing. After I graduated from Y Combinator, there was a lot of things that I couldn't figure out how to do, and I needed to find a co-founder. I kind of grew up on the internet, played way too many video games. My parents thought that was a total waste of time. Fred was certainly in high school into that in a pretty serious way, to the point where, in my opinion, he was kind of losing sleep and we needed to tell him to kind of go to bed. One time to try to get me to stop playing, my mom shut off the circuit breaker for the whole house. Needless to say, she was unsuccessful. After college, I went to work at Goldman Sachs as a foreign exchange trader. I thought it was the closest I would get to playing a video game for a real reputable job. Goldman is an elite institution, and the job that he got was well into the 1%. When I got there, I learned that this video game wasn't that much fun, unfortunately. I found Bitcoin on a blog one night and became obsessed. It got to the point where I was trading Bitcoin in the bathroom at work. One day, I see this post saying, I've created this demo app that makes it really easy to use crypto, and I'm looking for somebody to work on it with. Here I am thinking, yeah, it kind of seems like cryptocurrency is small and crazy and feels like a toy right now, but um, that seems like something I would really want to spend my time working on. My cell phone rings, and it's Fred. And Fred says, Dad, I think I'm going to go join this startup. And I said, OK. He decided to turn his back on lifetime financial security, sell all his stuff, go out to the West Coast for a highly risky venture. The office was a glorified apartment. It looked like a bachelor pad. <laughs> I think it I was an old building. And it, as a matter of fact, about a year or two after they we're in there, a piece of the building fell, over, fell off and hit somebody in the head. I, it, was, it was serious. I forget Inside if they the died building? Outside the building. I, I mean, it was an old, old building. We spent all of our waking hours together, six to seven days a week, constantly thinking about what can we do to make this better. It became clear that Fred had insane work ethic, and we had very complementary skill sets. I didn't know for sure if it would work out, but there was something special happening. At some level, it almost didn't even feel like work, just because I think we were having so much fun while we were doing it. We both did a bunch of coding and engineering, worked on the product, and then we both did a lot of customer support late at night. It was getting to a place where like, our whole day was answering support tickets, and we realized we need to start hiring. Hmm, I, re I, mean, I remember I came into their office, and uh, I thought I had a good chat with them. I remember thinking, this guy is really high potential. I reached out to him and asked if he would be willing to consider joining Coinbase. I am just like, unfortunately, I am kind of uh, busy with this thing, but you know, the best of luck with your journey. 
I was in Washington State working as a lumberjack, but I was paying very close attention to what was happening in the cryptocurrency landscape. And I wanted to see this in the world. So I just emailed jobs at Coinbase and said, I'll do anything. I knew I didn't have any concrete skills other than I knew a lot about Bitcoin and I was ready to work hard. The team felt like a family. What's special about a startup, right, is that everybody is sort of like sick with you and this shared vision for the future. Felt at the time like we're doing something incredible, but people would sign up for the product and they would never come back and use it. So business wasn't growing and we were on the verge of running out of money. We did not have product market fit. One of the key attributes of entrepreneurs is being too stupid to know they're gonna fail. There's really a very few startups that make any sense at the, at the point of startup. Otherwise, that firm would already exist. I called up some people who had signed up to use the app. I was like, what do you think? And they would say, well, I like the product, but I don't really have any Bitcoin, so I didn't have anything to use it for. So that kind of made me think, well, if there was a button to buy Bitcoin in the app, so you had some, would you use that? And they were like, maybe, yeah. We posted online that the feature was live. We went to bed. The next day, a bunch of people used it. And the day after, even more people used it. And the day after, even more. It goes from pushing a boulder up a hill every day to the boulders rolling downhill and you're chasing it as fast as you can. We were being inundated with customer support inquiries. The website was periodically going offline. We had all kinds of hackers trying to break into the site. From 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. was Brian's uninterrupted moment to actually build the website. We developed this system where interrupt me if it is a if it is some kind of emergency, but we had to define emergency. I would run up to him with a post-it note and I would write red alert and hold it up for him while he was still working. I think it was like the number of digits of money we would lose if this wasn't fixed in the next hour. Our bank was like calling us every day. We're probably gonna turn off your bank account if you don't get some more money in your account. And at that moment we rushed out to raise the Series A. A Series A is where a venture capital firm will place a bold bet on the company saying, hey, we think this has a chance of being a billion dollar plus company. So in late 2012, I got an email from Paul Graham. It said, hey, Fred, we're ready to do the Series A in Coinbase. Can I introduce you to Brian and Fred? We were so burned out and sleep deprived. We didn't really have a slide deck or anything. And we basically said, here's our revenue graph. We're using our working capital to fund this, and we're gonna run out of money in the next two weeks. Do you wanna invest? In the super early days, crypto company founders were either scam artists or they were almost like religious zealots. I meet Brian and he explains to me, I'm a former security engineer at Airbnb. I know how to secure crypto assets, will comply with the regulations. And he just seemed pragmatic. All right, we're uh, uncapping the champagne. Just getting ready. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating uh, the fact that earlier this morning, we uh, checked our bank account and it happened to have five million more dollars in it than it did last night. That is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> We briefly took a adjournment from the monitors in the office to go up to the roof and celebrate. Yeah. Kind of popped it and we kind of drank it and mostly just spilled a lot of champagne everywhere. Cheers, cheers, boys. Okay, cheers. But I remember it was maybe two minutes and then it was like, all right, we got shit to do. <laughs> Today we're talking about Bitcoin and we're talking to the founder and CEO of Coinbase. Coinbase is Ryan Armstrong. Co-founder of Coinbase. Fred Air Sam. I'm really excited tonight to um, share with you a little bit about Coinbase. Okay, uh, what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? A digital currency without the need for a central bank. What is a Bitcoin? Yes. The same thing email has done for communication, Bitcoin is doing for money. It's quicker, it works everywhere in the world. You don't buy Bitcoin. No, you can. There are currency traders online. Yeah, one Bitcoin's worth $3. We literally have our parents try the product. Does it look like a normal wallet? It's on your phone. So instead of carrying it in your back pocket. Yeah, let's these, see what's in your wallet. It's kind of <laughs> I'm told that the uh, protocol was developed by an anonymous programmer, Satoshi Nakamoto. I don't think it was Al Gore, do you? <laughs> Bitcoin's big day. The uh, cryptocurrencies hit the $1,000 value mark. It was pretty remarkable. The traffic on the site would grow tenfold in a matter of a month or two. It felt like 
all hands on deck just to keep everything running, and we had to scale really fast. We hired a ton of people, we almost 3 x in headcount. We announced the launch of the first U.S.-based Bitcoin exchange. I think we're now the largest exchange in the U.S. by volume. High five. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> and it's like nothing that I've ever experienced. You feel like you're at the center of the universe, you know? The price of Bitcoin went through $11,000. I could care less what Bitcoin trades for, how it trades, why it trades, who trades it. If you're stupid enough to buy it, you'll pay the price for it one day. Crypto is out there and it's not going away. But the question is, can we take the same technology behind Bitcoin and can we use it for more than just money? That's basically what Ethereum is. When Ethereum first came out, Fred came to me and was like, this actually is a big deal. We should go beyond just being a Bitcoin company. We have to add Ethereum. Initially, I was a little skeptical, but I, the more I looked into it, the more I felt like he was right. Our mission at Coinbase is to create an open financial system for the world. Billions of people have smartphones, but they don't have a bank account. So the cost of opening a bank account is is zero. Soon the world is only going to buy and sell products using bitcoins. Bitcoin has no unique value at all. It doesn't produce anything. You can stare at it all day and no little bitcoins come out or anything like that. It's a delusion. I fundamentally believe it is being used primarily for illegal activities. This is Silk Road. It's an eBay for drugs that use bitcoin as the means of exchange. One of the biggest bitcoin exchanges called Mt. Gox, based in Tokyo, went bust. Calls into question the future of Bitcoin. Mt. Gox got hacked and like Bitcoin crashed and the media went away and things cooled off. The numbers are pretty eye-watering in terms of the scale of the drop that we are seeing. The price of crypto had been trending down. Our revenue was flat to down. A lot of our competitors, they decided to pivot to do something else. We were getting to a place where we felt like, if this doesn't turn around soon, we're gonna have to do a layoff. Did anyone read that article about Bitcoin I sent you? And at the end of 2017, we started to see another crypto rally. Bitcoins are booming. Bitcoin broke another record. We are going through this period of growth that is almost never seen. This started as two people in an apartment, and now we're discussing global expansion. The Wild West. It is. It really is. Yeah. You're, like, you're like a cowboy in the Wild West. Well, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Fred. Brian's a very sort of calm, reserved, strategic, long-term thinker. And Fred's kind of was like, he wanted to mix it up, you know, constantly mixing it up. And of course, that combo is what made things work. But there was a lot of tension in the relationship. The closest parallel to having co-founders is a marital relationship. You're spending a huge amount of time together. Your economic futures are conjoined. Uh, you have visions about where you're going, where those visions, you're always gonna be working, they're never gonna be perfectly aligned. Brian and I met in August of 2013, and what he told me was, I'm looking for a coach to take care of the co-founder relationship. Fred and I had our first difficult conversation. Would you be willing to meet with us? I think co-founder relationships are just like any other relationship. They're all complicated. And you have to keep investing in them, like going to the gym. It's not like you just do it once and you're done. Brian started sharing with me a bit about what was going on, a conversation between them. And a couple minutes into the session, I looked at Fred and I said, you don't want to be here. And his response was, no fucking way. Pejoratively, I viewed it as armchair therapy. This is for weak people. I don't want my brain reprogrammed this way. What Brian and Fred needed to work out is at the end of the day, one of you is CEO and one of you's not. And that's a difficult situation for the non-CEO co-founder. Fred always wanted to run the company and it was never gonna happen. Brian was and is the CEO at Coinbase. I think he's done a great job in that role, but ultimately I think that was a limiting factor for me. So over time I got really excited about um, removing that glass ceiling for myself and starting something where uh, the sky was the limit personally. Fred, he's kind of a natural leader and he wasn't gonna be the CEO of Coinbase. I didn't wanna step down to CEO and I was really sad to lose him because Fred and I are kind of like brothers. Brian's one of my closest friends in the world. Of course, it's emotional, but um, I look back on that and, and think we handled it pretty well. I do feel emotions. I don't express them the same way as other people. 
you know, I probably have Asperger's, like somewhere on the spectrum. When I left Coinbase, I took some time off. I thought it was really important to explore all the different potential ideas I could try and adventure into next. On to Bitcoin now. The cryptocurrency kicked off the new year by tumbling. It's down 50% from the record set just about a month ago. Bitcoin is going to collapse because Bitcoin itself has no value. It's going to come caving in. It's, it's almost a guarantee. That was a lot. So uh, I'll, I'll try to start at the beginning. Uh, cryptocurrency is just digital money. And that's the simplest way to understand it. And people don't need to understand all the technology, how it works underneath. They're buying crypto because they want to own a little piece of it because they think it might go up in the future. And really, there's just a ton of potential about how it can evolve in the next 10 years. So for that answer, start with Bitcoin. Start, start pretty simply with Bitcoin. Yeah. Brian, these days when you talk about cryptocurrencies to laymen, how quickly do people's eyes glaze over? <laughs> it's kind of this mind-bending thing when you first read about it uh, that takes people a little while to wrap their head around. The short explanation I give to people, I say, this is digital money. You know, instead of for moving information around, like the internet, this is for moving value around. So what effect do the crypto scandals have on what you're trying to do? Whenever a new technology gets created, it can be used for good or bad. It's kind of the Wild West. And so um, that's been, I feel like, our role is to be, hopefully, an adult in the room and go proactively seek out uh, regulators and see how we can create um, a more trusted environment. So you've been described as a Vulcan Swiss banker. <laughs> I haven't heard actually, that one so in a I, while. Didn't, I didn't quite know what that meant. Uh, when I read it, it's sort of inscrutable and, you know, hard to get information out of, but actually I find you quite charming and open. Is, is this the, the new Brian Armstrong? Um, <laughs> well, I was a software engineer, right? I had never managed anybody. And when you, when you go make something and then suddenly it's like, oh shoot, I need to figure out how to be a CEO, right? I'm trying to find my voice as CEO, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully becoming a little more comfortable in my own skin, and um, I, think, I think we got along pretty well, yeah. Bill. Great to meet you, and uh, we'll carry <laughs> on. Part of me actually really doesn't like the idea of being a public figure, because I feel like it's so risky, people treat you weird, weird ways and um, you know you could slip up and say the wrong thing and just be the angry mob will come after you I've been mean, getting all this advice it's like well crypto needs a face of the industry maybe yeah. you can be it and it's like oh it's, I'm, I'm like a I'm like reluctantly <laughs> trying it out we'll see how it goes to be a successful entrepreneur it's very difficult to not develop the skills of an extrovert they might be introverts naturally, but they figure out a way to be very extroverted when it comes to their stakeholders. They say the meek will inherit the earth. They're not gonna inherit the NASDAQ. I remember seeing other CEOs and I would always be so impressed. I was like, man, they're so confident and that doesn't look anything like me. While Fred was at the company, a lot of the decisions were made. Just Fred and I would get in a room, hash out all the options, choose the least bad one, and move forward. When he left, I was feeling a little overwhelmed running the whole thing. You can feel like your identity is wrapped up in this thing, and so if it fails, I've failed. Now I'm questioning, it's like, what does it even mean for me to build something? I'm not writing the code anymore. I haven't written code in five years. Um, Do you enjoy it? Um, what do you love? Forgetting everything that is today. Yeah. You, that you've done already in your life. What did you love doing? I like just coming up with an idea for something and, and going and making it exist in the world. We live in an extroverted world. Most introverts feel like they don't fit in because of that. Introverts now, I think, are forming a majority of tech leaders in Silicon Valley because, of course, most tech leaders are themselves world-class programmers 
and you don't become a world-class programmer unless you start young and spend a fairly significant amount of time on the machine, which means not interacting with other humans. The elephant in the room is that you don't love to manage people, and my prediction, therefore, is that you're not good at it. Now I'd like you to go. I want you to go Cro-Magnon, whether you think you're Cro-Magnon or not. Uh -huh. Doesn't matter. Okay. And the structure of I blame forces you to go Cro-Magnon. Okay. Matt, I, I blame you for um, being so persistent on this and not letting it un unfold naturally. Every time we meet, we have to talk about the same goddamn issue. And <laughs> we've been over this a million times, just like, let me do my own thing. Awesome. Who else can you blame? Um, yeah, I blame myself, too, for trying to hold on to this thing that I'm not great at and um, isn't bringing me, isn't raising my energy. Are you willing to sort of see how these are crazy thoughts, you blaming yourself and you blaming other people? Yeah. That no one's a villain here. They're yeah. They're all just people that are trying to do their best. Yeah. Right on. Awesome. If I can share a thought with him, like, Brian, you're completely fucking up your role as CEO, and here's what I recommend you do. And with almost any other person, that their ego would go, what? How dare you say such a thing to me? I am all powerful. And with Brian, a big smile comes over on his face. And the first thing he says is, thank you. Because all he cares about is improving. And therefore, feedback is the most precious gift that he can receive. Because of how fast we're growing, the dynamics of trust within the company change really quickly. Not too far before I joined, there was like this level of assumed trust because we were like fewer than 150 people. Mm -hmm. We all kind of know each other. Um, and pretty quickly, we moved far beyond that number. And there isn't the same sort of assumed trust between employees. Yep, I agree. At 150 people, I can keep in, in my mind everything we're basically working on and who everybody is and their name and what they do. And past 150, it's like, that's even difficult to keep track of and occasionally, you'll pop into some meeting to hear a status update, and you're like, that's happening in the company I created? And like, <laughs> I can't believe it. We're about 800 employees now, and we're learning how to operate at this larger scale. You're never gonna retain great talent if you don't treat them with respect and give them opportunities for growth. And also, top people, they don't wanna come work at companies unless they have some mission or purpose that's bigger than just making money. Looking at the event object and just printing out everything that it has, it feels like I could be building the infrastructure for the future of the financial industry. Democratizing money is a huge deal. So as soon as I read the Bitcoin white paper, I was immediately like, yes, I have to do this. I work on key storage, but it's all designed so like, especially I can't take the key. I mean, I like to think of myself as like a blue collar engineer. I'm here less about like speculating on cryptos and more because there's cool problems to work on. A lot of the people in crypto grew up during the 2008 financial crisis. I grew up seeing my neighborhoods be decimated by foreclosures and family members losing their houses and jobs. So I don't trust banks. A bank is a testament to a belief system. You trust that the bank will take care of your cash, but you also trust in the overall financial system that it represents. And in so many towns and villages and cities, the major buildings for a long time were banks and churches. The idea of the bank was to be the place that protected your money. And everything about the architecture was intended to make you feel that your money was safe. The banks made that impressive architecture in part because it's this psychological game of like making people feel like they can trust them. And so, you know, if you have the impressive columns and like, oh look, you know, this is like the Acropolis, come on, like this bank is totally gonna last 2,000 years. Well, let me just try to paint a picture of what a, a bank would look like if it were decentralized. Because a bank is a centralized thing. They have your account balance, their power over you and everyone drives from their exclusive access to those account balances. 
but there's a different way to organize those account balances where each of, say, a thousand computers has a copy of those account balances. If they then agree on each change because they see a digital signature by the account owner saying, move money from my account, and a majority of them agree, it will always be a consistent set of account balances. So. It's a beautiful thing. Part of the genius thing about Bitcoin is you don't have to trust any one person. There is no one person in charge. Nobody runs Bitcoin. Nobody is the boss of Bitcoin, right? The code is what you're trusting. So it doesn't matter who Satoshi Nakamoto is. It doesn't matter at all. You don't have to trust Satoshi Nakamoto to use Bitcoin. You just have to trust the code. If you think about the history of financial scandals recently, the London whale trade, the mortgage crisis, things like that, all of those things at some level were examples of where human trusted parties are fallible or, or even potentially criminal. But technology is technology. It, it isn't criminal. It has no motive. It's not looking to make more money. It just balances accounts. That's why crypto ultimately is solving a, a thousand year financial problem. And it will supply the trust that has been lacking. Oh my God, donut day. We're here highlighting different features and products to figure out ways to actually use cryptocurrencies to buy like day-to-day -day items such as donuts and burritos. My personal favorites. I'm so glad you guys are doing these dog footing sessions. The reason it's called a dog footing event is the idea that when you're trying to like teach your dog new things, okay. you give it treats. We are basically incentivizing people to try out this new product that we are going to launch tomorrow. That's weird. I can't use my um, USD coin as payment to instantly buy. You have to do a conversion. Yeah, conversion. That's a fail. Where's my, where's the consumer team? <laughs> Awaiting payments. Actually, I sent, hmm. So is this is pending? Sense, right? Yeah, it should take a little bit of time. This is from the consumer app. This is one of these things I want to try to instrument this year that's like end to end. What is our average time from person like pulling out their phone to it seeing a green check box. Hey, how's it going? Good to meet you. Just joined. Oh, nice. Which compliance. compliance? Welcome to the team. When Bitcoin came out, it was You got like, excited about it. Oh, my God. This could change the world. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I thought by now we would be mainstream. Yeah. And, uh, well, this is, this is why I want to do stuff like this, because for it to be mainstream, we have to iron out all these little bugs. All right. Good stuff, guys. I'll send in my feedback. But this is really good. Yeah. Cheers. Even something as simple as the credit card, when it was first created, no one knew how to use it. When you walk up to the store, do you give it with one hand? Do you give it with two hands? We had to learn how to do all of those things. And the same thing is true of crypto. It doesn't feel native to a lot of people today. In order to actually get to mainstream adoption, we have to demystify the space. All right, we're live on YouTube. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Sam McInvale. We've had a lot of good questions from the community. What is the next level in, quote, trust? To become the most trusted is a low bar in digital currency. I would push back a little bit on that trust is a low bar in digital currency. <laughs> I haven't seen firsthand how much effort goes into securing digital assets. It's incredible. I mean, it is a level of investment that uh, is actually unparalleled in any other asset class. And then how do you build trust? Trust, uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier. To me, it's track record. Many banks have existed for well over 100 years. I mean, Wells Fargo's logo is people coming west, you know, in the late 1800s. <laughs> um, it's going to take some time for trust to really build. Trust is like this reservoir, you know? You can, every little action that you take, you can put a little bit into the reservoir and bank it up. And then, you know, if something, you make a mistake, you can, you might have to make a little withdrawal of that reservoir. Um, so I, I'd like to think we're putting those in, in there so that if we ever do make a mistake at some point, we can come back and fix it and people will kind of give us the benefit of the doubt. People are mad. Delete Coinbase is a movement that just started recently after the acquisition of Neutrino by Coinbase. Neutrino is a, we'll say, controversial blockchain analytics company. Coinbase acquired Neutrino, which was a group of people from Hacking Team, which was an organization that used to like uh, work for dictators to hunt down dissidents. Hacking Team are responsible for selling spyware to oppressive governments. I have to talk to you about Hacking Team. It's a really, yeah. I know it's a tough one, and you've taken a lot of 
I, I think, well-deserved criticism for this one. That's definitely an area where we made a mistake. We went out and did some diligence on the team, but most of our diligence was around the technology itself. What we failed to do was the diligence that was kind of more around um, our values and our culture and, and that kind of thing. And so when we did make the acquisition, we started to see a lot of noise online about people saying, hey, do you know, do you know who you just acquired? While we looked hard at the technology and the security of the Neutrino product, we did not properly evaluate everything from the perspective of our mission and our values as a crypto company. We took some time to dig further into this, and together with the Neutrino team, have come to an agreement. Those who previously worked at Hacking Team will transition out of Coinbase. If your due diligence fails on this, how are people meant to trust you with the privacy related to their purchase of Bitcoin? Yeah, there's, there's really no excuse I can give you. So all I can tell you is that we make mistakes as well. And um, a lot of building a company is like trying to learn from the mistakes and just get better over time. If you don't have the ability to be beamed in the face and then get up and, you know, blood spewing everywhere, get back to the plate and try and swing harder. You know, you're not meant to be an entrepreneur. All right, sorry I'm late. It's easier to consume content when it's in sort of a template, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was almost imagining we could get this down to three slides. I mean, I'm gonna be nitpicky here, but let's just kill all the placeholder text. That'd be my default solution. I think sometime next week, you should see a new version ship that'd be much more stable. This is really cool. I'm glad that we're doing such extensive user testing. It's like, if we're actually gonna get 100 million people or a billion people using this thing, it's like, it's got to be way simpler. Absolutely. Yeah. We're kind of caught in, I think, an inflection point where we have to be eyes wide open about what really is going to resonate with people. Well, and crypto is just not understood. I think people tell themselves that's not for me. A few things need to happen for Bitcoin to become more mainstream. We need to drive real world utility of Bitcoin because um, today people are speculating on the eventual uses of it. And like, this is going to be you know, the future of the entire internet economy, or it's gonna be useless, and they, they, have, they oscillate between irrational exuberance and despair. Cryptocurrencies went on a wild ride today, wiping out recent gains. Bitcoin has now plummeted about 60%, falling below $6,000, and trading right around an eight-month low. And this You have to understand, whenever crypto has like a cold moment, you have to see my phone. People are telling me their lives are over. I'm like, guys, like, the key to crypto is that every time we have a crash, the ceiling raises a little more every time. So the first time Bitcoin crashes to a couple hundred bucks, next time it crashes to a thousand, next time it crashes to five, next time it crashes to 20. We've seen the volatility of Bitcoin decrease every year for like the last five years. And it's now less volatile than some fiat currencies. From my commerce experience, this is how commerce kind of works, right? It works on spikes. It, you have some users kind of coming and then you do a big sale event and it spikes. And then it settles in a next kind of higher baseline and right. then it spikes again and it spikes again. It's yeah. Kind of like similar probably, like hopefully, like crypto. I'm trying to always hire people who are better than me at each of their disciplines. Our chief product officer, Surajit, who just joined, was at Google previously and then at Flipkart. He helped both of those companies grow to the next level. When I joined Coinbase, people were like, every few years we have these bull runs in crypto, and then everything breaks because we just cannot estimate how much demand will, will come to our platform. So I thought, okay, let's create a project to prepare for this bull run scenario. And we have to do it now when there is no bull run. And what could be a good name for that project? Pamplona is this city in Spain where they have these bull runs every year and it suddenly clicked <laughs> Project Pamplona. The next bull run in crypto happens and our systems start failing. The opposite happens. You actually, your baseline shifts downward. Mm. That's a big risk for us. There will be glitches and you have to prepare for the glitches. It's like how NASA, for example, sends that rover in Mars. They will have like ways to fix those failures or glitches remotely. They have backup systems and so forth. That's how we always think about it. When I look back at early days of Google, there was always this thinking that we are building a company that comes once in a lifetime. I see a similar ambition and possibilities. And I think that possibility exists not just for Coinbase, for the entire crypto industry. Of the 90% of people who have heard of cryptocurrency, 
I'd say half have probably just heard it in passing and know that it's some kind of new crazy internet money thing. And then I think there's a small minority who start to have a glimpse of the larger picture, which is crypto will be the biggest force in driving quality of life across the board. Crypto has the highest likelihood of being helpful in places where something is broken. Governance, financial institutions, social bonds. There are over 2 billion smartphones out there and far fewer than that bank accounts. And now with this technology, you can effectively have a bank account on your phone. And that may not be interesting to you know, an American or Western European, but it's very interesting to someone living under hyperinflation like in Venezuela. Their money's depreciating by about 50% a month. The money is becoming worthless. Fundamentally, we just want to see if we can help people with this. But one of our ancillary goals or secondary goals is, can we actually spark crypto economies in the world? Because that would probably bring more economic freedom. Bitcoin is the revolutionary human rights tool. We're talking about this tremendous opportunity for all these people to be their own bank. They can actually control their own value, their time and energy that they put into their wages. They can custody into something that can't be taken from them. Cryptocurrency is the first time you can have an electronic transaction that is censorship resistant. Violence sent a wave of anger. In Belarus, we saw pro-democracy protests. Police were detaining thousands of people. We saw protesters cut off from financial services in their country. This nonprofit was able to then raise $3 million in Bitcoin in order to support people who'd lost their jobs in the Belarusian government or elsewhere because they were protesting for democracy. What happened here has deeply unsettled Nigerians. And in Nigeria, we saw protests against police violence where people cut off from the banking system who were able to live and be supported because of Bitcoin. Despite the corruption in that country, there's this balance between freedom and state control. And certainly, uh, cryptocurrency in general, and Bitcoin in particular, makes you think about that. And I, and, I, and I think the challenge to regulators is the bar is moving pretty far, pretty fast. There's a lot of skepticism in government <laughs> about crypto in general. Do you ever get that feeling that, you know what, I just want to tell them how this actually works. I want to educate them. Um, well, it wouldn't surprise me if that happens, because I, I do think crypto is going to keep becoming more and more relevant in the world. It's actually funny, when I go to DC, usually all the staffers that are in the kind of the waiting room, they all come up and are like, Coinbase, like, I love Coinbase, I have the app. <laughs> and then I go meet with like the senator or the congressman, and they're like, hmm, what is this technology about? For the first time in his presidency, President Trump publicly commented on crypto and he doesn't like it. Bitcoin, uh, it just seems like a scam. Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong tweeted, achievement unlocked. I dreamt about the sitting US president needing to respond to growing cryptocurrency usage years ago. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. We just made it to step three, y'all. Crypto could be even more dangerous for consumers. They help terrorists and criminals move money around the world. Terrorism financing, criminal activity of all kinds. They present real risks through their use by the criminal and terrorist organizations trying to conceal their illicit activity. I was a federal prosecutor for over a decade, prosecuting organized crime with the United States Department of Justice. I felt a deep sense of doing what's right and bringing people who have broken the law to justice. The Mongols are in a fierce, bloody feud with the Hell's Angels. I prosecuted a high-profile murder involving the Hell's Angels and the Mongols motorcycle gangs, a case involving the Nuestra Familia prison gang. I also prosecuted corrupt federal agents investigating the Silk Road case. Late 2012, one of my bosses in the Justice Department came to me and said, there's this new technology that's being used criminally called Bitcoin. We need to get to the bottom of this. A new website sells illegal drugs to anyone who is willing to pay. Payment was in Bitcoin. I thought, this sounds criminal. And I started looking into it, like, what was Bitcoin? And that was when I had a really powerful aha moment. This is a technology like the internet. It's not inherently good or bad, and it's not a thing that can be prosecuted. In fact, we were able to use crypto technology to trace criminal activity. The first time I met Brian, I actually remember it well. A first impression that some of us in the government had was that people involved in crypto didn't believe in laws or regulation at all. Brian really stood in stark contrast to that. 
the main transaction where we see funds leaving the fraudster account. This goes actually to a Coinbase customer. Our job is to assist law enforcement and other agencies around the world, help catch bad guys. The interesting thing about crypto is that we can see everything. If we were bank investigators, it'd be like following every bill that has left a bank and gone around the world. We've got really good tools. We've got a great relationship with law enforcement. Our primary goal is we want to be able to protect our customers. My dad was an Air Force officer. We moved around a lot, and I was always kind of the new kid in class, and um, I was bullied a little bit in school. After I became bigger than most bullies, then I was able to kind of help some of the other kids that were being bullied. It gave me some compassion for people who had been victimized online. It's our job to gain their trust and know that we're doing the right thing with this technology. We are responsible for safeguarding the financial well-being of, at this point, 30 million people around the world. You can think about cybersecurity as chess. You made a great opening move, the attacker made their move, but what's next? How far ahead are you thinking? Getting security right is foundationally critical for the future of cryptocurrency. I think it's natural that it takes a while for there to be infrastructure and an ecosystem of tools built up around a foundational new technology. When electricity was invented, it took a long time from the original spark until we lived in an electrified world. I think we're just going through a similar arc of development of cryptocurrency. The most important technologies in our lives today are the ones that we don't see or think about. We don't think about the electrical system unless it's off. We don't think about the very complicated system that we have of bringing running water into our homes unless something happens to it. And crypto, I think, is headed in that direction where, yes, it will become embedded and essential, a component of the infrastructure as essential as water or plumbing, sewage, electricity. A shelter-in-place order for some 7 million people in the city by the bay. They are expected to stay home, all in hopes, of course, of stopping the spread of COVID-19. Everybody is working as hard or harder than they have, and in the face of this change, feels less productive than they have. This may be just me out of touch or something. Like, I mean, I don't have kids, so let's put that aside for a minute, people with kids at home. I mean, I feel like I'm just as productive at home in, in the last week is, well, I mean, but maybe I just, I don't, I just deal with stress well. Like, I don't, these things don't really phase me. So what's the deal? What am I missing here? Someone was like literally in an alley today because their partner needed their one living room for the call and they don't have a bedroom. I think it's also about the like emotional burden that people have adjusting to like what's going on in the world. Yeah, I mean, Brian, the way I would yeah. think about it, if I can just be really candid is, I suspect you have the single best setup in the whole company, right? Like you're a single guy, you have a high speed thing, you're well prepared, there's nobody in the room. Like, I, I have a good setup, I'm good, but like, I think we need to think of ourselves as in the vast minority and that everybody else is facing a greater tax than we are. Yeah, yep, totally fair. Once the COVID stuff is over, some percentage of the company is gonna to wanna to come back to the offices. Other people seem to be more productive at home. So we'll have to see what employees wanna do and where they feel most productive. The virus is continuing to spread. Growing fears the virus could tip economies into recessions. 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment over the last week. And the question now is, when are the jobs going to come back? March of 2020, much to my horror, I was watching the entire economy shut down while Wall Street had the biggest rally in a decade. The monetary response of the central banks was to expand the money supply and take the interest rates to zero. The result of this was a quick V-shaped recovery on Wall Street while we had an L-shaped recovery on Main Street. You know, if you had a billion dollars invested in Wall Street assets, you were going to make 25% this year doing nothing. And if you worked 25% harder on Main Street, you were going to get nothing. And it struck me that money was broken, right? The economy was broken. The problem that everybody faces, every company, every individual, is how do I store my money without having it dwindle away? So what is this Bitcoin thing? 
We went down that rabbit hole. I started researching it. I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin represents an instrument of economic empowerment. It becomes the solution to billions of people's problems. It becomes the solution to 100 million companies' problems. And it becomes a solution to every investor's store of value dilemma. Michael Saylor says Bitcoin is the safe bet after moving his firm's cash to crypto. His company MicroStrategy has bought more than a billion dollars worth. What's critical for the human race is to keep upgrading its technology. And uh, Bitcoin represents a uh, material upgrade to monetary technology. Technology is the highest leverage way that I know to have an impact on the world. Other people, they'll tell me, you know, I really like mentoring kids because they're going to have a much bigger impact than some app. I get that. But for my skill set or my mind, the way it works, I'm like, I want to go for scale. We still have lots of hoops to jump through with the SEC to make this work. Everyone is working basically from 8 a.m. till midnight daily. Yeah. I Maybe mean, we just shut down the company for a week make everybody go take time off or something. When you're ever you're trying to go public, it's always a lot of work. Fall Fruits is our internal code name for our process to go public. We're having a lot of discussions about all the mechanics of how it'll work. It's like drinking from the fire hose and trying to not make any major mistakes. So my initial thought was like, okay, maybe Coinbase should just go public in a crypto native way and issue a crypto token that is a security token, meaning it represents a share in Coinbase and lists our token on our own exchange. That's kind of where the future is going. Someday it'll all go through a computer, Brian. It's kind of, it's yeah. like it's on its way to, to your utopia, but it's not there yet. <laughs> okay, I guess, yeah. So now we're becoming a public company. Do we want to do a direct listing versus a traditional IPO? I think the arguments for, for direct listing set or align with the internal external reputation we want to have you know in the, in the direct listing you're saying we're going to let the market set the price we don't know what the price is goldman doesn't know that these investors don't know let's set the market set the price and anybody who wants to buy can buy um direct listing feels more quote unquote fair to me one of the things a lot of entrepreneurs try to figure out is like do i even want to be a public company ceo because there comes with its own set of challenges but I think it comes with a lot of positives. It's a way to have big impact. I have a very specific vision in mind about what I want us to accomplish. A lot of it comes to economic freedom. That's what the mission of Coinbase is about. It was a painful night in Minneapolis and a day of difficult questions about the death of George Floyd. According to new reports in a company town hall, an employee asked Brian Armstrong a question about Black Lives Matter and whether he supports that movement, and he declined to answer that question. And there was actually a small employee walkout as a result. Part of leadership EQ is knowing that there's certain events that basically you have to say something. There are people who are really affected by this, and they're reading into your actions. I'm kind of like a believer in Black Lives Matter, the movement, right? But I don't, I don't want employees to have an expectation that the company should be a mouthpiece for their own personal views. So it was our Q3 all hands where we're going over what's been going on. And I think Brian was like pretty emotional while presenting it too. When I look back on the walkout that happened, I know a lot of you were disappointed in me as a leader um, in terms of my lack of response in that moment or um, you know, just not leading in the way that you wanted. And I get that. And, um, you know, I'm not going to get everything perfect. The mission is what we all came here to do. It's, it's kind of the thing that unites us. You know, it wouldn't be fair to kind of jump into another topic or another um, cause in the world that we didn't all come here to join. I feel passionate that I want the workplace to be a refuge from the division that's out there in the world. Some people feel like, um, you know, you have red and blue states, there need to be red and blue companies or something like that. And I reject the extreme positions on, on either side there. I feel like there's an opportunity to create a place that's welcoming for all people. Ryan Armstrong wants his employees to know that they are in the cryptocurrency business, not the business of social activism. Armstrong says Coinbase, quote, won't debate causes or political candidates internally and will not engage in things unrelated to their core mission, offering about four to six months of severance if they decide to quit because of that new policy. So when Brian made that statement, I was like, oh, he's gonna get crushed for this. Brian Armstrong essentially said, you either shut up or get out. 
that notion is actually anti-Bitcoin, right? We talked about the democratization of Bitcoin, right? It wasn't intended to create a space where we censor people. Brian Armstrong's memo basically said, we want to be mission driven. Clearly, the company is having an internal crisis. People are still really connecting this back to BLM. It has nothing to do with BLM specifically. It's about an alignment in our culture about where we're going to spend our time and energy. What they are really caring about and they want to know is that, does the exec team care about them as humans? And they specifically expect this empathy from Brian. I mean, hopefully we all do that with the, with the people on our teams. I mean, just checking out, how are you doing, right? That's what it means to like care about somebody. There's a part of me when I hear that, I'm like, that's not really what was happening here. It's not just that. People pinned us on the spot about whether we were going to make an external commitment to this political movement. Leadership is hard. And I think for Brian, an innovator who wants to build, wants to focus, but also leaders have to create spaces for people to talk about things that happened outside of the company. So you have to have all of these considerations that have nothing to do with the business, but it's about the welfare of your workforce. I do believe that people deserve to have their voice heard. And I would never make that decision that Brian did. But my company, we're a small shop. When there's 15 people in a room and few of us disagree, compared to 500, it's different. But I understand why he did it because there are too many variables, like, in the world to, to think that you're gonna be able to have that kind of open dialogue in an office setting and things are gonna be, no, it's chaos, war. It's gonna be Twitter in your office. When I was leaving, I do think I felt some anger that his position is what made me want to leave, but he did what he needed to shape his company the way he saw best fit. You said that companies shouldn't get involved in these issues. Can you explain? You know, I think every company should really pick something big that they wanna to try to solve in the world. And for us, that's economic freedom. And it's important to have everybody aligned and rowing in the same direction um, to really go tackle something that big and ambitious. I think if I were gonna do it again today, I probably would have acted sooner and I would have made it even more clear. Part of the reason it got to the place it did was that I just, I noticed that it was an issue, but I kept trying to sweep it under the rug because I didn't have the words to really deal with it or the experience. Really kind of unfortunate thing, it was really stressful uh, for everybody involved, but it was actually the, one of the most important things we did to get clarity as a company to all be aligned and moving towards the mission again. So the cryptocurrency boosters argue that crypto is the yellow brick road to a faster, cheaper, and safer financial system that works for everyone, not just for the biggest banks. There is no question that our financial system needs change, but I'm not convinced that crypto is the solution. Instead of leaving our financial system at the whims of giant banks, crypto puts the system at the whims of some shadowy, faceless group of super coders, which doesn't sound better. I'm meeting with as many people from the Treasury and senators and executive branch that I can to establish relationships and try to be helpful as people try to wrap their head around crypto and what this industry is going to be. I'm just picking up Katie, by the way, at the hotel. Eventually, hopefully, this can turn into a clear regulatory framework for the industry. Hey, although he was always wanting to play by the rules and build a company that abides by them, Brian himself never had any interest in going to DC meetings. I think that's one of the signs that Brian's really matured into being a CEO. It's he knows this is his responsibility. Fred and I were co-founders. He, he was always the one who'd be like tromping around DC and like doing all these, you know, meet with DFS mm -hmm. and I could just focus on product every day. Yeah. Like, Crypto is a brand new industry and therefore it is undefined. We have to go educate the government about what crypto is and what the advantages are. With innovation, we're always going to come against entrenched interests. 35 years ago, when I started practicing shoe leather politics, I was working for National Semiconductor. Maybe someday all watches will be made like the Seiko digital alarm chronograph. Up till then, all watches were mechanical. The old watch industry passed a law 
forbidding any watch in the United States that had a chip yeah, in it. No, so same old story. We had to repeal that. <laughs> we repealed that law. Being the CEO and founder of the biggest company in the industry, Brian has that responsibility. I was nervous that maybe he wouldn't put on a coat and tie. In DC, it's about respect. If you wear a turtleneck, they're still going to talk to you, but it's going to get them off focus. They're going to be thinking about the turtleneck. Let's keep them on focus, and we can get right down to work. We've all seen this movie before. Just like the internet, we believe that the crypto industry is going to create millions of jobs if we can get regulatory clarification. One of the biggest hindrance on this space has been lack of regulatory clarity. The government has a number of problems in providing clarity for crypto. The American financial regulatory system's insanely fragmented. It's going good. The center just wrapping up this prior meeting. Sure. You've got the OCC, you have the FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Treasury Department, FinCEN. It's crazy. And then there's also the state law issues. And so that multiplies your problems by 53 states and territories who all have to have some base of education in order to figure out how to apply their laws. And they are going to treat this thing with respect to their specific policy concerns. The next meeting is Pelosi's office. Since we're in the Capitol, I'm gonna tell her, hey, just have somebody walk us over to Schumer's office. There might be some anarchist type folks that are like, why would you ever meet with the government? I love freedom and I want there to be an open financial system for the world. I also am a practical person and I realize we live in a country that has laws and I'm trying to navigate a path through that. We have a lot of problems in our society and the only way you're gonna fix them is if you change things. So change is, is a natural part of life and I think you have to write your rules and enforce your rules in a way that recognizes that change is going to happen. We've got to embrace innovation. We've got to let people try things. Some things are gonna fail and some things are gonna work, but as long as we think that it can be done in a way that's consistent with the rules in our marketplace, we should let it go forward and let investors decide. I love the idea that a whole new generation of people is thinking about solutions to problems that have really plagued us for a long time. I couldn't really read him. Is he just a very calm and thoughtful and kind man, or was he disinterested? I couldn't tell. I think very much the former. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he's quite stoic. Most of the politicians we've met are so extroverted. They're just, they can't help but like launch into all these yeah. stories. And he's just like, mm, uh -huh. thank you for telling oh. me. And he wouldn't say anything else. <laughs> well, he said he had an engineering background, didn't he? Mm. So. A pattern. Maybe there's something to that. Yeah. I am here trying to build trust. It just says a lot to show up in person and meet people that can't really be replicated in any other way. And hopefully when they meet me, they realize I'm trying to do something good in the world. Well, if there's a bill introduced, then they'd have to go get educated on it. Imagine that Electronic Commerce Act. So what if there was a Crypto Commerce Act? Yeah. I don't know. I'm just making this yeah. up. But it's such a nebulous concept. And to get all the different parties to actually work together is like pulling teeth. I think the way to look at it is it's a game, and the government makes the rules. And they can keep changing the rules until they win. And they have to win because they have to collect taxes, fight wars. There's no way we're going to live in some libertarian world where there's no government thanks to cryptocurrency. That's just nonsense. Crypto is just like any new technology, like the internet. Are some bad people gonna to try to use it? Yes, but the vast majority of people in the world are good, so with appropriate controls and protections and regulations, you can mitigate the risk, but 99% of the people in the world are good. Let's, let's let them use a new technology. That's what propels the world forward, and creates jobs and improves human quality of life and everything. I don't wear a suit too often for work, but I'm coming to DC. When in Rome, I guess wear the suit. Seems to help. If you let people keep the upsides of their success, you get economic growth, which benefits everybody. I think it has all these positive downstream effects in society, whether that's health metrics like infant mortality or around education or how well the environment is protected or the income of the poorest people. Apparently, it positively correlates with like happiness in society and less war. So I think that's what cryptocurrency can actually enable. We're ready to go. We set a realistic bar for ourselves, 
Anyone who we felt like, you know, we had some synergy with, that we counted as a huge win. Hi, this is Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. I got a note that uh, Senator Schumer wanted to connect real quick. Because that meant we can go back to that person and continue the conversation. Hello, Senator Schumer. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate the time we had and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. All right. He was real chatting, wasn't he? Yes. Well, he's busy, but he said he wants to keep keep no, in touch. He wants to make sure I knew that his door was open. So whenever you talk to him on the phone, he just about hangs up. That's an efficient meeting. I like, I like efficient meetings. A lot of these people we're meeting with, they're very optimistic and they're gonna get it done, but it's, I mean, it could take many, many years. So in the meantime, we just gotta keep building. Not long after we invested in Coinbase, Brian emailed me and he said, Fred doesn't own enough of this company. I want to give him some of my stock. He's brought enormous value to what we're doing. And, you know, I just really feel like he needs to own more and I'm going to give him some of my stock. Could you advise me how to do it? And you know, ultimately, it happened. That never happens. Like, never does somebody come and say, my co-founder doesn't own enough, I'm giving them more. Like, it's always the opposite. I can't believe how much I gave my co-founder. They're not carrying their weight. I want to get rid of them. Fred demonstrated his value to Brian, and Brian matched it with generosity. That's a big part of what binds them together. Boom, headshot. Come on, there's lots of other people on the field. I just shoot, know. shoot other people. Fair, but... <laughs> sure. We went through building this company together, which was an incredibly challenging and formative experience. And it was really critical to have a true friendship. Your girlfriend posted a picture of a kitten that needs fostering, and now my girlfriend wants to adopt it. <laughs> How does this work? The other way around. What do you mean? Uh, turn it upside down. There are a number of reasons why we work together really well that also make for a really great friendship. That's something that I really value and I think transcends anything that happens in the business. Switch. They built something amazing together. Fred remains on the board. He's Brian's biggest supporter. I have a very fun job now on the board at Coinbase. I just get to lob fruit and rotten vegetables at Brian and occasionally pitch in my crazy crypto futuristic ideas for the business. I feel extremely privileged to have been able to build something that has gotten as big as Coinbase has. And I'm really excited about doing that all over again with Paradigm, a crypto investment company where we're helping entrepreneurs build the next things that are gonna be world changing. So that's like an $80 million trade. You can see like it routes some like USDT to die. I think eventually all of finance will be built on top of this technology. My sort of hope for Uniswap is for it to be this fair uh, piece of the financial infrastructure that is powering this more equitable financial system. The word cryptocurrency implies that crypto is just about currency, when actually crypto itself is about much more. I feel like this is basically giving people Goldman Sachs level trading tools in an interface that anybody can use. We're at the early stages of a digital financial renaissance, and I think it's really exciting to see what this could mean. Could we make finance more inclusive? Could we make finance much more innovative? There's definitely like a perception of crypto as anarchists. When you actually learn about the community, a lot of the people have very reasonable beliefs, and they usually kind of relate to you know, wanting to make a better world. As society and civilization become more complex, more and more of the things that we do do depend on large groups of people's ability to cooperate with each other. The social layer of any technology is something that's uh, more important today than it was 100 years ago, and it's definitely going to be even more important 50 years in the future. If you actually step back and look at where we are in literally, like, history, this is a significant, significant moment. If you actually want to do some shit and you're not satisfied with the way things are currently, 
Crypto is offering this promise to affect real change for so many people around the world. All of us ultimately want to change the world. We want to create value in the world. And we all feel that this technology might be the fastest way of achieving the vision that we have for the future. It's history in the making at the NASDAQ. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We have an exciting morning here at the NASDAQ. All right, stand by secondary line. Crypto trading platform Coinbase finally making its highly anticipated Wall Street debut. All right, the auction will officially start at 1010. As it becomes the first major crypto business to go public in the United States. Eyeshadow, eyeliner, and bells on. We're ready to go. Today is certainly an important milestone for Coinbase, but it's also an important milestone for the crypto industry. If you want to give them a, a, an early look, um, and this is going to, this will change because like a lot of stuff goes into the book right around the time the auction starts, but right now it's looking $320. Hey, Benny. But I'm just touching base. Uh, this is super preliminary, but it does feel like right uh, three, low 300s is the right zip code. Yeah, it's, I feel very, I feel very comfortable. So there's Jay Heller that you're seeing right there. So he's actually on the phone right now with Goldman Sachs, and he's really giving them very detailed information where all the buyers and all the sellers are to make sure that we come up with the right price before we open up the stock for trading. Starts. And the goal here is to is to open the stock at the right price and as stable a price as possible. Not open it quickly. Most important trading event in, in Coinbase's life. You're going to get it right, but I hope you uh, all wore comfortable shoes because this will take a while. Sounds good. Thanks for the update. So I'm going to go back to work. You should treat everything that you hear on here as, uh, as confidential. All right, Coinbase first update. Demand's been building all morning on the NASDAQ auction. The auction will officially start. I woke up with fucking jet fuel in my legs. I went for a run this morning and just like crushed. You're a better man than me getting up that early on, on oh. today. Going what for a run. You know? I, I just woke up and came to check in on the, the live stream. I, <laughs> I'm not that much of an early riser. Hopefully it all plays out according to plan. All right. Yeah. Cool, man. All right, well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll see you on the interwebs. Yep. See you on the live stream. All right, never mind. All bye. All right, the Coinbase NASDAQ auction is going to start in uh, two minutes at 10.10. There is no more fun day on the trading floor. Everyone gives me a fist bump and says, game day, Benny, and it is game day. All right, here we go. There's the opening bell. Yeah. They're doing this countdown of uh, 21 seconds, symbolizing the 21 million Bitcoin that can be mined. Right now, we're coming up with what's called an indicative price based off of the supply and the demand. A million and a half shares of retail demand came in in the last uh, in the last second before the auction started, and so the uh, the first look in Coinbase is three hundred forty dollars on three million shares. Coinbase first look three forty on three million. That was that was a bigger uptick in demand than I would have expected. Wow. I love Coinbase. And Kramer's on CNBC, so that'll be some more upward pressure here. Three fifty on four million. Tick tick tick. Current look three fifty on five point two million. Hello. I'm going to work with you on audio and video. Is there a way you or somebody can tilt the camera down a little bit for me for framing? Yeah, let me try to, let me try putting it down just a tiny bit. Or it's the new world of TV. How's that looking? Thank you, sir. Five, Good morning. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on Coinbase's big public listing day. Ryan, could you tell us how you came up with the idea for Coinbase? Yeah, sure. So it was 2010, and I was home for the holidays at my parents' house, and I happened to read the Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto. All right, still building here in Coinbase. Plan is to open the stock in the next 30 minutes. Well, we learned a new piece of information about 30 minutes out. We were in this because we wanted crypto to work. We wanted there to be more economic freedom in the world. We are getting closer in Coinbase, 377 on 8 million, so finish your lunch. Goldman Sachs, when they are ready to give us the green light to open up the stock, they will verbally repeat the size of the order as well as the indicative price. People no longer need to be scared of it like in the early days. There, there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity here after the open. Five minute warning, Coinbase. Get your flow in if you're sitting on the sidelines. 382 on 8.7 million, got stuck to buy on balance there within five minutes, standby for 
pretty open. Don't go too far here, because I guarantee you, um, we are getting close. It truly is a new economy. It has hundreds and thousands of companies being created in this space. The stock will open within the next two minutes. I got the two minute warning, two minute warning. How can we really leverage this opportunity to create more jobs, more economic growth for people in every country in the world that embraces this? This is like the moment at the wedding. Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, here we go. All right, hi, guys. Hey, man. All right, I see the stock $381 on 8.83 million shares. That is confirmed. That is what I say. Open the stock. Opening at 381. Stand by. All right, there's nothing cryptic about this. The first public block of stock in the blockchain. The Coinbase Genesis trade is 8.8 .8 million shares at $381. That's an ocean of nearly $3.5 billion, the largest opening trade in NASDAQ history. I think the second largest trade in exchange history. Let's go, Coinbase! All right, ladies and gentlemen, we officially opened up the stock at $381 on 8.8 .8 million shares. It is a historic moment for cryptocurrency. The IPO is really the start of the next phase of adoption and the future of the digital economy. Welcome to the NASDAQ family. And I, I should mention, uh, we are live and I can prove that we're live, which is that uh, Coinbase stock is now listed and trade it. Um, so uh, <laughs> congratulations. Oh, man, it's kind of it's kind of an overwhelming uh, moment. There's so many things happening, so many emotions. And I mean, uh, the biggest thing I just want to say is that this is a entirely a group effort, like the, the customers that helped us get here, all the employees. It's a really rare group of people who saw this trend early, made a bet on it, came together, and I think it helped us get to where we are today. This is not the end, this is the beginning. We all have a lot of- If you think about the way the internet changed from like 95 to 2005, I mean, from going from getting your AOL CD in the, in the, in the post mail to having an iPhone in your pocket, I mean, that's what we're about to go through. It's not a once in a decade thing, it's a once in the history of the human race thing. I think that we'll see some of the promise, the early promise, of this industry really blossoming into something that affects people's daily lives in, in, in what I hope is a positive way. Cryptography has created something very exciting to highlight its true power, and now it's gifted us the opportunity to do something to make the world a better place, and this is the time to do it. How's it going? Um, I'm doing all right. I slept a little bit last night, not much the night before. On the day Coinbase went public, I briefly stepped out to give my dad a call. Oh. I feel like my conversations with my dad are pretty consistent. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. He definitely makes sure that I remain grounded, and I very much appreciate that about him. We had been talking about this for so long. I knew this was going to happen at some point. It was a bit like dropping your child off on the first day of college. You know if things go right, there's a high probability four years later they're gonna graduate. Okay, love you. When I talked to Fred, I had a, uh, several different kind of feelings running through my body. Um, um, I think the, um, one feeling that um, I got really close to was was um, wish, wishing my dad could have seen it. Um, I was proud of Fred before Coinbase, and I look forward to continuing to be proud of him. Nobody knows for sure how this technology revolution is going to turn out. Yeah, I don't know that I understand it. I really don't. But I do trust that Brian <laughs> understands yeah. it. We're really proud of what he has done, not so much as a company, which the company is amazing. I mean, we keep watching it and say, you know, but it's just he's still the kind, generous, thoughtful person that we grew up with, too. So we're proud of him for both of those things. I've never really been good at celebrating things. <laughs> I just like building things. I'm always thinking like, all right, what's next? What's next? What's next? On IPO day, I had a mix of emotions. This is hilarious. 
as everyone was focusing on the valuation and the financial outcome, I sent both Brian and Fred a text. And that text simply said, while everybody's celebrating, the thing that I'm most proud of is that you two are still best friends. <laughs> <laughs> They're all clapping on a trading, the trading floor. Holy shit. You worked on a trading floor. I like literally sat right there. There isn't a sliver of light between them that people can pierce to say those two aren't as close in reality as they appear to be. And I think it is a fundamental part of the success of Coinbase and for them individually. A jackalope is a fictional character, right? It's a jackalope. <laughs> It's an antelope and a jackrabbit. Why do you never see lizard eggs? I assume they must lay eggs, right? I wonder what the frontiersmen thought when they saw this. You think like, oh, this is really beautiful. Or they're just like super on task. Gotta build this dam. This is super cool. Oh, wow. It's machinery to sift the gold out. It's probably like pretty advanced technology at the time. Yeah. I wonder why they called it the Wall Street Mill. They left Wall Street due to other opportunities, just like you. <laughs> I feel like we always fall into a natural rhythm where on hikes you go out first. It just feels more natural for some reason. I don't know why. Are you walking first? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's. There's probably a deeper meaning in that thought. Yeah. <laughs> you think you would have made a good frontiersman? Mm. Questionable. <laughs>